Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Weissman from the University of New Mexico as today's seminar speaker. Gary is the Albert and Mary Jane Black Professor in Hydrology at UNM and has done many things over his career with extensive experience in industry, the public sector, and as a faculty member at a prestigious R1 school. I first met Gary a decade ago when he was one of the leaders for a workshop on teaching hydrology, hydrogeology, soils, and geochemistry in the 21st century. And I'm happy to say that our worlds have come into contact many times in the years since. His work on education issues, as well as addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the geoscience classroom has been very inspiring, and I learn something new every time we have a chance to talk. Um, so Gary's presentation today uh, is entitled Building an Inclusive Environment in Academia Through Activation of Multi-Context Theory. With that, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, John. That's very kind. Uh, I, I always enjoy our interactions. And, have, have always valued those. So today, uh, I, I want to present a different approach to uh, inclusion and uh, social justice and what some would call diversity. Um, <clears throat> before I really get going, I, I've got to acknowledge my collaborators. I'll acknowledge them at the end on this as well. Um, mostly Roberto Ibarra, who's Emeritus Professor uh, here at UNM. Uh, Michael Howland Davis was a PhD uh, candidate working on the project for a while. Michelle V. Lamy and uh, Emily Castillo are currently working on publications with Roberto and I on, the, on some of the stuff that we're, I'm presenting. I also need to acknowledge uh, that, that the University of New Mexico sits on traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indig indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. And at the University of New Mexico, or uh, University of Minnesota, it's built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the peoples on whom, whose land we live, learn and work as we speak, seek to improve, strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. These are available on websites at most universities, and I think these acknowledgments are really important for us to to be aware of. So let's dive in. When you think of diversity, what definitions come to your mind right away? Give you a couple of seconds to think about this. It's like, what are you thinking of when somebody says the word diversity to you? <clears throat> well, the Geological Society of America has a diversity statement stating, diversity today generally refers to a variety in race, ethnicity, color, national origin, that's ancestry, sex, creed, religion, age, genetic information, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, disability, veteran status, marital status, medical condition, pregnancy, ed education, class, potential, political affiliation or parental status. Quite the mouthful, but uh, it's, it's a pretty inclusive uh, statement. Why is diversity important? There's an NRC report out that's now over 10 years old uh, that talks about the future of STEM work workforce is uncertain. So we need populations and numbers to fill in what's necessary in the STEM workforce. Also, there's a shifting demographics of our domestic population. So underrepresented minorities are becoming uh, a majority in many places and, and uh, business as usual, we have to have some diversity in there. And then diversity is an asset. It expands the STEM talent pool, enhances innovation, improves the global economic leadership. Have collected thousands of samples of debris. The first explosives expert <laughs> arrived from Monaco at 9:30. He viewed the bomb site, sniffed well, the air, we'll let the bomb and site thing kind of finish out. Lewis. Probably simtex, military stuff. Far more than necessary to kill one man. I say the bomber got a bit carried away.
I think you're back on Gary. Okay, I, I can unmute myself now. Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, if we look at this, it talks about in, in enhancing innovation, but nobody really knows. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. I talked to Kara today. Some people know why it enhances innovation, but many people don't. What are the goals of these statements, though? The goals are increased numbers of women and underrepresented minorities in our institutions of higher education. It really focuses on the numbers, but it really doesn't talk about anything other than bringing in more people. And so the goal is also to create a level playing field in academia. And how do we do this? Well, we have targeted scholarship availability. We have admissions policies, affirmative action prior to court rulings, but we still have admissions policies that bring in underrepresented minorities. Academic preparation and remediation. I actually really dislike this one because it has this assumption that um, underrepresented minorities are somehow not prepared. I disagree with that. Uh, ethnic studies and multiculturalism. We have programs on campuses uh, that are, are multicultural and we celebrate these different cultures that way. One would think, though, that, that that would work. And at the University of New Mexico, those admission numbers have been achieved. We're an, <coughs> we're an R1 Hispanic serving institution, one of the few. And you might think the playing field is level, but it's not. We still have issues tipping that playing field. And so what are the rules that are needed to make this playing field level? Well, most programs on diversity are one sided. So what's the source of the pro program? Is it scholarships funding? Probably not. Admissions policies? We have it. Uh, insufficient programs and in multiculturalism? No, we have those here. Are the students prepared to succeed? Yeah, they do quite well. So what's the underlying is issue uh, and the source of diversity? Well, I would say that we have an assimilationist mode at the universities. And I'll explain more about the richness of this as I go through it, but it implies an us them framework. We bring them to us. And once they are accepted to the university, we assimilate them into the disciplinary culture that's expected. We make everybody fit the mold of our academic culture because we think it's correct. But we work to teach them to teach, think how, as scientists, but they already have this background and knowledge everybody does coming in, it may be just slightly different than the worldview that we have. Also, a lot of the diversity programs are what my colleague Roberto would call saddlebag programs. If you're familiar with riding on a horse, the saddlebag carries the non-essentials. The horse is the essential, the reins are essential, the saddlebag carries the non-essential stuff, and most diversity programs are relegated to a diversity uh, council or, or office on campus, not really tied to daily activities. So when we look at a campus and different models, there's the institutional history, which I'll talk a lot about here, of what the academic and disciplinary cultures are, what are the teaching models that are used. When we look at diversity in, in broad terms, there's the structural diversity, that's counting numbers, head counts, affirmative action really was used to try to address structural diversity issues. There's multicultural diversity, which is celebrating different cultures, having them have their places on campus, and we can celebrate uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, or, or other cultural activities. And then there's this thing that I'm presenting today called context diversity. And that's really goes down to the core of ways of knowing and doing in uh, that are culturally developed. Uh, basically, as one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Alicia Chavez says, basically stuff you learn before you're five years old. So <clears throat> the issue of diversity today, the Dean of Harvard Business School a few years ago noted that our institution, like many others, has made great strides in increasing diversity. That's numbers. But when diversity advances without inclusion, when we do not create environments where people feel like they belong and thrive, tensions follow. More importantly, we fail to realize the benefits of diversity. So this concept of inclusion is really important. So what is inclusion? Well, Oxford Dictionary says, it's practice or policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources uh, and, and uh, to people who might be excluded and marg or marginalized. 
Purity uh, in one of the uh, recent papers on diversity says, whereas diversity refers to differences within groups, inclusion speaks to how these members are treated and how they feel. So inclusion seems to be really important. So let's dig down into this with the inclusion framework. There are these iceberg models of uh, covert white supremacy and racism, where the stuff above the ice are these hate crimes and KKK, burning crosses, swastikas, things that shock people. Below the surface, though, there's this kind of more subtle racist feel that is pervasive through the society. Now, I won't call people racists. Uh, there are some that are, but but really what we're looking at isn't the individual racism, which is an individual's assumptions of reality that say, um, I'm better than others based on my skin color. But the systemic racism is really where we're trying to uh, focus and look at things. That's policies and practices that are entrenched in the institution. They result in exclusion, promotion of designated groups. It's different than overt discrimination because there isn't individual intent. It's just the way we do things. And I, I want to give a view for how we approach that systematic racism, systemic racism. What's it about in academia that creates that bias towards one group, uh, making diversity difficult to attain, especially in our STEM fields? So what I'm presenting today is this thing called multi-context theory. It explains and predicts inclusion or exclusion of people uh, within the institutional culture. So let's dive into some of this. I'm going to present in the next 14 slides descriptions which have an A or B side to it. What I want you to do is think about where your institution fits on this spectrum between these two end members that I'm presenting. And then also think about where you fit. What I recommend is you're sitting at a table probably. Take out your pen piece of paper and mark how many times you mark A versus how many times you mark B. So first one, side A. In my organization, paying attention to the goal is important in getting the job done. Being nice to people is not as important as completing the job. Side B. Work relationships and group work in my organization is important in getting things done. Being nice to people is more important than completing the task. Think about where you fall, A or B, and think about where your institution is on which side. Okay, mark that down. Next one. People in my organization clearly spell things out, quickly get to the point, and may appear to be blunt. People in my organization often talk around the main point, telling stories to make themselves understood. A or B. Third one. We value individual work. Grades are mostly based on how individuals show their abilities. Or B, we value group work and how individuals operate within various groups. A or B. If you're kind of in the middle, mark in the middle, that's fine. Next one. Success in my organization being, means being recognized. I make sure everyone knows what I've accomplished. Or B, success means being low key. My organization values humility. I don't talk about my achievements, they speak for themselves. Next one. Disagreements in my organization are not to be taken personally. They value the tough it out approach. Or disagreements in my organization are personal and must be worked out. They value the talk it out approach. A or B. Next. Privacy is important. We're concerned not with disturbing others' privacy when working in groups. Or B. Privacy is less important. We're interest, we are more interested in working with groups than worrying about disturbing others' privacy. A or B, we value speed and efficiency versus we value accuracy and completeness. A or B, we prefer to work alone or B, we prefer to work in groups. Next one. A, we take deadlines seriously. Or B, deadlines are goals to be achieved. <clears throat> Next, A, we learn best by following directions. Or B, we learn best if someone demonstrates what I need to learn. A or B, information is power and not shared until the work is complete. Somebody might scoop me. Or B, information is shared freely. 
Ideas improve if they're openly shared. A or B, we value linear logical thinking to problem solving. Or B, we value intuition based and nonlinear approaches to problem solving. Next. A or B, A, to understand a complex system, we under, work to understand components of that system first, then work to see how those components interact. Or B, to understand complex systems, we first work to understand connections between components, then we work to understand the components. And then finally, A or B, A, disciplinary departments are valued to conduct research on various topics and to teach students. Or B, Disciplinary departments are not emphasized here. We evaluate things broadly without disciplinary boundaries. Importantly, I went through this A or B, neither side is right, neither side is wrong. They're both valid ways of knowing and doing all the way through. So reflect on this. Did your institution fall mostly on the left or on the right? Did they fall on A side or B side more? Think about yourself. Is the way you approach these similar to your institution, what you think your institution is? Or do you approach it in a slightly different way? And finally, what do you think it's like if your approach doesn't match the institutions? Again, neither side is right or wrong. They're just different. And most institutions fall on the left side, the A side most academic institutions, not all, but most. So that brings us to the, that's kind of the, the basis for multi-context theory, the A or B side. And I'll explain that even more in a little bit more detail. Back, this is all based on his work by Edward T. Hall back in the sixties. He was uh, here in New Mexico, worked a lot with the local uh, tribal nations and he recognized that there are these preferences or cultural contexts. Now, Roberto Ibarra brought it further along than, than this binary and also saying all cultures act like this and individuals in a culture act like this. That's one of the complaints. But basically what he sees is these different ways of knowing influence how one interacts and associates with others, influences on how you use your living space, how you perceive time, how you respond to various uh, teaching and learning styles, and how you perform academically or in the workplace. And again, these are imprinted on you during childhood. It's cultural. He came up with this binary of the low context versus high context. And low context requires little social or cultural context to communicate, interact, and interpret the world around them. Uh, and those tend to be the Northern European co cultures, German, uh, English, and so forth. The high context cultures require more social and cultural context to communicate, interact, and interpret the world. Again, neither is right or wrong. It's just how we use the context, the situation that we're in, that makes the difference. Higher education is predominantly a low context culture. Uh, that's because it was derived from a 19th century uh, Germanic re German research model and mixed with a uh, English uh, model of education. And so that creates this conflict between low context academic culture and high context academic preferences. That, that's a dissonance. Uh, and, and because more women and underrepresented minorities tend toward being more on the high context side of the spectrum and it's a continuum, uh, that this uh, creates a, a conflict with a lot of underrepresented groups and we think explains a lot of the numbers in terms of diversity. So what do we mean by this? Well, the cultural context is conscious and unconscious behaviors or beliefs that sets how we do things and perceive the world. So it's a spectrum, and that's really important to understand. And individuals operate in that spectrum depending on the context of the situation. But the low context cultures tend to be individuated they're private, they're compartmentalized and object focused, think in terms of linear logic, they're scheduled, and then have a contextually independent view of the world. Whereas the high context cultures tend to be interconnected systems and connections focused. They look at cyclical and mosaic thinking as opposed to linear. 
less schedule sensitive and have a contextually dependent view of the world. And again, I'll explain this a little bit more. Again, the thing that Roberto found in terms of multi-context theory is this binary breaks down with individuals and we operate along a spectrum between these two sides um, depending on the situation. Uh, the, the challenge comes since the low, uh, academic culture is low context, people who tend to have preferences in this low context side of the world thrive in the academic world. High context people are forced to be more multi-contexted and operate in the low context world uh, to be successful in academia. So what do we mean by this? We broke this down, or actually Hall broke it down and Roberto broke it down, but we really focus on seven attributes for uh, cultural context. That's interaction of how you get one-on-one -on -one interactions up to association, how you work in groups and with others, how we deal with time, how we deal with space. And you can see these are getting larger and larger concepts, uh, how we deal with information, how we deal with learning and what the purpose of learning is, and then finally, the academic systems and what those look like. I can give you more details on this stuff and I'll give you resources in the end on this. So let's start with interaction. The low context world has low use of nonverbal signals. The words are the things that are important. This talk is a very low context form of communication because especially on Zoom, you can't really see me and there's no body language. Whereas the high context uses a lot of nonverbal signals. A great example of this if Roberto was in the room and I was in the room at the same time, when we speak English, we tend to just focus on the words. When Roberto is speaking Spanish to colleagues, body language is in there. They're in their faces. They're the, the, the communication is as much of the, the uh, body language of uh, what the face looks like as anything else. Also, communication is direct. When we're grading papers, we write that really direct thing that says, you forgot the comma here or you, you didn't use the right words, very blunt. Whereas communication in a high context world, you might talk around the points, but eventually people get the idea. Messages are literal to uh, exchange communication, whereas messaging is more of an art form in the high context world. Again, it's a spectrum all the way across this. We aren't on one side or the other. But here's a, a visual. The, the low context person is really looking at the words and the task whereas the high context person is looking at the situation of the meeting and the whole thing, tone, posture, social status, words, task, all these things are going on and being viewed by that high context person. In terms of association, this is how we work in groups. In a low context world, we're really worried about the task. How do we get this thing done? In the high context world, we're really worried about how the process is going. How do we get through this? Um, I can remember when I worked at Michigan State, I was sitting at a, uh, I do a lot of my work at coffee houses, and I was sitting at the coffee house and a group of men came up and sat down and talked about their research in the table next to me. And it was all about the conclusions and the task and how they got it done. And they got up and left. A group of women came, sat down at that same table, talked about their research, and it was all about the process of research. Now they did talk about the conclusions, but they really were concerned and focused on how did the research develop? How did we do this in that process? Really, in, I didn't know about this stuff at the time, but it's a clear example of different ways of processing information. Success is individual recognition, and that's definitely our low context uh, academic world, whereas the in the high context world, success means the group gets the recognition. In the low context world, it's team oriented. When we build collaborative research projects in a low context sense, Basically, we get a team of individuals with specific skills and one person does their job, passes that baton on to the next. They do their job, pass the baton on to the next. Example, in my own research, I was on a project where I did the geology of an aquifer system and I mopped and modeled the geology and the heterogeneity in that. I took that information. Somebody else did the geochemistry and reactive uh, work. We passed that on to the transport modeler. He did, he and his students did their work they pass that on to the reactive transport modeler. That person did his work. In the end, there was a publication. My name was on it, but I didn't do much of the reactive transport stuff. And I really wasn't involved in the research project. I had passed my baton on. Whereas an informal culture of group oriented in the high context sense is work is interactive. Even though you may not have direct influence in specific tasks, 
you do have your input into those things. And we get together and we talk about stuff. I've been involved in both types of research projects and they're both very, they're productive, but this one really is truly interactive amongst everybody in the project. <clears throat> in terms of time, time is a commodity in the low context world. It's spent, saved, wasted. It's scheduled. We start our classes at the hour. We end them at 50 minutes past the hour. Um, we have deadlines. They're critical. The students have to turn in that homework at 5 p.m. this evening, or they're considered late, even though you're not going to look at it at 5 p.m. That deadline is arbitrary, but those deadlines are really critically important to us. Whereas in the high context world, time flows at a pace. Deadlines are to be achieved, but other things you want to get that you want to you value accuracy and completion. So a lot of our high context students don't turn in things at the deadline and they they're late because they want to make sure it's done and complete. Uh, so they might need a couple more hours or a couple of days or they want to talk to you. So there's a difference in the way we approach it. I, from my own culture uh, coming out of, as a Jewish American, we have what's called Jewish standard time. That's like everything starts 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late. That's because time is a process. And in that 15 minutes before things really start, after that scheduled time, there's a lot of social connection that happens. It's really important time. Uh, we're changing that to be more assimilated into the modern world now, or into the Western culture, I should say. Territory and space. Space has more boundaries, larger social distance, personal space is compartmentalized, individual, individualized, and private. Whereas in the high context world, space is shared. Privacy in the low context world is important. We do, don't disturb others and we don't butt into their personal lives. Whereas in the high context world, we're always checking in and the personal life is as important as the, the private life. Information. Information is power in the low context world. If somebody, I don't want to be scooped on this thing. Uh, whereas in the high context world, it spreads rapidly. Most important is that in a low context world, information can be uh, separated from context of it. Uh, whereas in a high context world, information without context is meaningless. A great example of this is math. We teach how to solve equations without knowing why you would care about this derivative or this integral or whatever it is. And that's how math is taught. It's completely out of context. I can also pick on our own field of geology. Often mineralogy and crystallography is taught to look at the, the minerals and what is the shape of it, but it's completely out of the context of why you really care about that mineral, how it develops, where it develops and, and all of that. Same thing with said strat, which I do. I'm looking at a sand, uh, thin section of sandstone I may not be thinking about the full context of where it came in. And I can do published studies that don't deal with the context. Somebody from a high context culture will look at that and say, this is really ridiculous. How can you understand anything without understanding the context of where it is? That's why a lot of our high context students don't do well in math. They're looking for that context and understanding, and it's just not taught. In terms of learning, Learning in a low context world is rational step-by-step -step approach. It's compartmentalized. We teach geology. Somebody teaches mineralogy, somebody petrology, said strat, hydrology. We have our compartmentalized learning, even though these things really do overlap, but we don't teach it that way. The knowledge in, in a high context world is nonlinear and not compartmentalized. It's interconnected and synthesized. Low context, we, we start with abstract and theoretical values, and then we'll maybe move towards practical. Whereas the high context, they want to have the practical start. Also, learning is individuated in low context versus group, and, and demonstration is really important for the high context people, whereas uh, description is important for the low context. In academic systems, we value examining ideas rather than application. Whereas in the high context world, We've, they value the, the application of knowledge in real world events. So it's more applied science is important here. Linear logical and low context versus systems thinking. Uh, fragmented topics are departmental disciplinary boundaries versus uh, a non-disciplinary uh, world. So 
this is the multi-context world. And we think it's really, really important to broaden, not, not limit one or the other. Again, low context and high context are valuable and important as a spectrum, but we only in academic systems honor that and value the low context and we devalue the high context side. What our research has found, we, we uh, worked at a, a large Southwestern research university in one of the LSAMP programs, and we offered these workshops to both faculty and students. And what we found is in both students and faculty who uh, from underrepresented groups who tended to be high context, they felt a greater sense of belonging as scientists and a validation. Some of our um, uh, tenured faculty who we interviewed after they attended the workshop said that, yeah, I've always done research in this way. I now feel like I, I, I'm, I'm doing it right. I'm doing a valid approach, even though all the messaging that I've ever gotten from the university is my approach is fine, but it's not really valued. So they, they get that validation and sense of belonging. Students and faculty, once they're aware of this uh, multi-context spectrum, find that they can navigate the academic system better. Uh, we had one uh, graduate student in our, our group talking uh, to other, uh, reporting back to us during an interview, saying that there was a, a classmate, a, a colleague, who was ready to drop out because he was so frustrated with working with his mentor. And this student who was participating in our, our uh, research said that um, he described, oh yeah, your advisor is working in a low context world and you're coming at it from a high context sense and could explain it and you articulate it using this language and that student stayed in, in the program and was able to navigate some of those, those conflicts. Faculty who uh, were exposed to it found that they could uh, successfully initiate and activate approaches to increasing diversity in their research labs. And by, by doing pretty simple things and changes in their classroom, they, they, they could build this in, inclusivity. And then finally, there are new ways of doing collaborative research in, and research activities uh, that are more socially relevant. And right now, I want to throw a, a, a shout out to, um, uh, to Kara in your department because I read through this, Kara, after you gave it to me uh, this afternoon, and it's describing a multi-contexted approach leaning heavily on high context approaches to successfully build a collaborative convergent research program at the University of Minnesota. And, and this is exactly what I think that, that socially relevant approach is going to be to building collaborative science. It doesn't mean that everything we do has to be that way, but it just broadens our approaches to science and actually brings social relevancy and collaboration in a new way, in a multi-contexted way, to build new ways to do science. And I actually think that's the way we can approach very complex concepts that are environmental problems that we're facing, global warming, uh, environmental de degradation, how we deal with drought, how we deal with all kinds of changes. They're complex and multi-contexted, and that understanding that system and the place of everything in the system is really important. And working with groups who aren't the trained low-context scientists, but also see all the stories and connections, I think that's where science is going to go. So. What does this mean for higher education? We need to activate context diversity in all activities of the institution. It takes systemic change. We use the term activate because it's already present here. It doesn't have to be a saddlebag program anymore. And it can be realized through all levels of the institution. At the institutional level, we need to understand that cultural context is what and why people do what they do and have that awareness of this spectrum being there. I don't think multi-context theory is the end all do all for diversity, but what it does is it articulates different ways of knowing in a way that most of us can under, understand or at least recognize. We may not, I don't fully understand multi-contexted ways of doing outside of what I do, but I can articulate what might be going on with others through this language. Academic systems can be organized. And at University of Minnesota, you have the uh, office that's looking at um, how collaborative science and community-based science can work. 
and it doesn't always meet the metrics of what our standard tenure process is. But just because it doesn't meet those metrics doesn't mean it's lesser. And so the academic systems need to recognize that and, and have different ways of measuring value. We need to expand the multi-context experience of teaching, learning, research, and administration. Uh, this is really important. It considers what's wrong with the system first, not the people in the system. Those remedial programs to bring the students in, they're basically assimilation programs, and our students come prepared with a worldview. Some of them need to learn all the details, but, but we also have to value what people bring to the table also. In terms of that institutional level, there's this power structure um, by, by uh, Croissant of originally and then modified by Lawrence, where we look at the individual level of knowing and then we influence a group, that group comes back to individual and, and we end up in this loop of doing diversity with small groups and we love it. But to bring it to the institution, it has to be forced by some of the institution directives and then forced down into the, the individual and groups. Most diversity programs end right here at the group level. They never get to the organizational levels. We need to be aware of this. In terms of departmental things, we need to think about tenure review and include and prioritize high context values such as community or professional service as much as we review the uh, value the metrics of certain types of publications. Our curriculum content can be expanded pretty easily to include high context learning modes. And when we hire people, we tend to have them do that research talk. But when we're listening to those talks, if that talk tends to be kind of storytelling, and those of you in the room who tend to be from a low context, you'll be sitting there thinking, come on, get to the point. If that's happening in the talk, stop and look at that. And it's probably high context storytelling. And storytelling is one really important way of building the connections in the system and understanding and describing the system. It's very hard to describe a system in a linear logical way that most talks are arranged in. So we need to try to find ways to value that high context uh, storytelling. And we don't need additional funding for this, just training. And it's not very hard training. In terms of individual research programs, is your research PI driven or community driven? If it's PI driven, that's the typical low context approach that, that is important, but those ideas come out of our minds. Whereas if it's community driven, your research area might not align exactly with the question of what they're trying to answer, but you do have a component of your research expertise that can play into it, which means that you need to collaborate completely with other experts that can focus on that problem, which again is, you guys have it in your, your department, those of you who are working on the rice thing, that's what they're doing. And, and it's hard in the, the academic culture as it is set now, because community driven science takes a whole lot more effort in, in building those relationships. Uh, but it's, it really does build social relevancy to our research. Research teams can operate in a multi-contexted method instead of the baton passing, think about how do we work with the system that we're in. And some people will want to do that detailed analysis of the components, but always there will be somebody in the group who's got that expertise and sees the connections, and we want to tap into that. In terms of a classroom, we want to mix high and low context activities. Our theory, our hypothesis is that um, it's the multi-context individuals who will be successful in the science into the future because it'll be socially relevant. You can do the, the low context work and the high context work switching back and forth. So sometimes we'll I'll in, uh, emphasize the high context uh, uh, material, systems thinking, relationships and connections. Other times I'll start with low context of so the details, isolated components, and then build these into the the mapping. In this case, I'm teaching our intro environmental science, and they're mapping the carbon cycle before we get into the details of what's going on in each of the components, and they're drawing those system maps. So that's going from high context to low context. Other times, I'll start with the details and go to the high context concepts. So we mix first theory, then application, versus application, then theory. And I do this in all of my classes. I'm going back and forth between these as much as I can. Uh, in this case, we, we uh, in my hydrology class, we were looking at microplastics and 
building a whole project about what is the, the system that brings microplastics into the Rio Grande. In this one, this is my environmental studies uh, system science class. And we go down to the bosque, the cottonwood forest that's there. And before we go and measure trees and look at uh, relationships between the geomorphology and the cottonwood growth, I have the students sit and think about the system. What are the connections in the, the system of the bosque? We aren't gonna study all those connections, but we start with that high context. Other times I'll start with those measurements and build them up from there. When we do lecture classes, where do those fall? Think about it, those are really low context approaches. They're compartmentalized, linear logical. This lecture that I'm giving you is linear logical. It's a very high, low context approach. Can we do a high context uh, student? One of our interviewees said, some, so one of the ways I could incorporate low context is try to be more active participant in the lecture because I'm not really a lecture type person. So it's easy for me to kind of get lost in the lecture. So maybe asking questions and being more involved in lecture with my instructor would help me. Might frustrate the lecturer because that breaks that, that, that timing. But recognize that your high context students are in there and they're getting lost because they need that interaction. They need that, that demonstration. They, they, they want to be communicating and, and in, in, interacting with you. The activities that we use, some are high context in nature, some are low. Jigsaw activities are, are very popular. Those tend to be emphasizing the low context baton passing approach. Whereas the systems diagram tends to be high context. Multiple choice is a very low context approach. That's why only certain types of students do well on those. And then the place-based approaches tap into the high context learning. Just because your classroom isn't active, is active, I mean, doesn't mean it's multi-contextual. So doing this intentionally is, is really helpful. Scientific writing, very linear logical. It's very low context. Once our high context students understand that though, they're able to just flip into low context mode. When I taught uh, an environmental science class, our capstone, which is project-based, I, I, we were uh, doing the systems map of a, a mine site. We did an environmental characterization of the Harding mine that, that the university owns. And then when we got down to the end, we were writing about it and compiling the environmental assessment document. And I, I could look at the students and say, OK, flip into low context mode. We're going to be blunt. We're going to be direct. We're going to be linear logical. Flip your brains. And they did. When we were in the uh, systems mapping, OK, flip into high context mode. We're looking at connections, not uh, details. And the students did that. I think teaching that multi contexted way of thinking is really important. When we teach science, I think our 101 classes are the most important to attract students in. But when we teach this low context approach, linear logical approach to how science works, it's saying that this is the way science is. I would challenge anybody in the room to say, this is really how I do science. It, it usually isn't. That's how we publish science, but it isn't how we do it. How we do it is really articulated well by this understanding science project that was out of the uh, Berkeley Museum of Paleontology. And um, basically, it's very nonlinear. You bounce in between all of these different ways of doing where you might get feedback uh, uh, in peer review and come back into the gathering data. And then you'll talk to people and then you, uh, you stumble on something and say, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then you do that. The linear logical is in here. You hypothesis, expected results, uh, actual results, testing things, but it's bounced around pretty nonlinear. And that's how most of us do science. When we teach it this linear logical way, our high context students look at that and say, that's ridiculous, that doesn't work. When we teach it this nonlinear way, all of the students join in because it has the linear uh, portion and the logical portion, but it also has the nonlinear uh, serendipity part. So what are the benefits to diversity in geosciences? Well, the themes are typically social justice and global competitiveness, but I would say this advances science. This is how we do earth system science. It's high and multi-contexted people do this naturally. The, the project that Kara is on is naturally high context and multi-contexted. And the um, people in the communities she's working with tend to approach the world from a very high context connection point of view. So 
in order to build that and understand system science, I think we need more multi-contexted, high-contexted people in our community so we can actually do this because they walk into the room and they automatically see connections. Low context people walk in the room and they see those attributes of details in there. Both are important, but in our academic world, the low context has been overvalued and the high context has been devalued. So diverse approach is needed. We need the low context approach to understand components of a system, the high context approach to bring, understand the system and connections, and the multi-context training allows our students to link between these seamlessly. It's inclusive and it allows everybody, all of our students and our faculty colleagues to thrive in the academic setting. I think if we can approach this, we, we will have leaps and bounds towards an inclusive world. So if you want more information, Roberto Ibarra has this book, uh, Beyond Affirmative Action. It outlines the multi-context theory. I think chapter three out of that book is the most important. If you're interested in activating this in your classroom, uh, Alicia Chavez and Su Susan Longerbeam. Alicia uh, is retired out of UNM. Uh, Susan is at uh, NAU, Northern Arizona. And they put out this book that talks about individuated versus integrated approaches. It's same as low and high context, but they talk about how to bring this into your classroom. Chapter one out of this book is excellent for doing that. And then uh, my colleagues and I have a paper in the Journal of Geoscience Research or Geoscience Education, JGE, that describes this multi-context path. Also, there's this, uh, oh, I should have had the, uh, the QR code up here. I forgot that. But there's a, um, a disruptor blog that we have in AAAS that describes multi-context theory in a, in a pretty good way. And, and here's what the let me, uh, whoops, come on. Here's what that website looks like. It was an invited uh, uh, thing. I assume you guys can all see this, but in here, there's this low context versus high context cultures matrix. And basically what it does is it's a document that outlines more details about that spectrum. And then we go in and we describe more of the multi-context theory further down in here. It's, it's a, I think a, a good concise, resource to be able to get yourself back into the uh, and understanding what's going on with multi-context theory. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, spending your late afternoon with me, especially if any of you have uh, young children. I know this three o'clock to four o'clock time or four o'clock to five o'clock time is really challenging, uh, but thank you for coming. Again, I acknowledge my uh, colleagues and their contributions. Also the acknowledged National Science Foundation and the, the grant that we received to do a lot of the research work. And I'm happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, our uh, tradition here is for students to be given the opportunity to ask the first set of questions. So if there's anybody uh, online wants to unmute or put something in the chat, that would be awesome. And John, if you could keep track of the chat while I'm talking, whoops, yeah, while I talk to people, that would be helpful, but I'll try to keep track of it too. Hi, Gary. Uh, my name is Chris Hempstead. I'm a graduate student and science educator. Um, I really enjoyed the slide that you had on the scientific method versus the alternative method. What is the alternative method called? And when I compared the two methods, I saw a lot of similarities between them. It, Sure. They both kind of have a sick, they're, they're different in terms of how they look visually. I guess, what are the key distinctions between the two, method and, two methods in your eyes? Well, I think reality is the, the difference. The, the book method that we, we present as the scientific method is really the linear logical approach to how we publish things. That's how our papers are developed. But I don't think anybody really does science that way. I think we really do science more through that other method. And if you want to read more about that, that's if you just type in Understanding Science Berkeley, you will find that Understanding Science website. And they go through, I use that exclusively in my one-on-one class to teach how science works. I don't, I, I, I almost pull the Robin Williams, pull take in your textbook, rip those pages out on understand on scientific method because they're not accurate. 
Uh, and I, I go through some of the exercises that the Berkeley group put together on understanding how science works. And, and really when you look at, when you go to that website and watch some of their videos on scientific method, you'll see that that's really the way we do it. And in the middle of that circular diagram is that hypothesis, hypothesis, test, observations, all of that. But what we do with it after that is really what's going on in that whole cyclic diagram. And it's very nonlinear. My favorite part of that is serendipity. I cannot tell you how many times in my research I've been out in the field and I stumble on something and I say, oh, I wonder why that is. And that's led to a full on wide realm of, of research. In fact, the fluvial geomorphology that I do, it was just that I was seeing fans and distributed fluvial systems over and over and over in every sedimentary basin that I saw. And that was before Google Earth. When Google Earth came in, I could test the hypothesis, but it was just serendipity that I happened to be in the uh, uh, Denali National Park. I looked at the map on the wall and in the Foreland Basin, there are mega fans, just like in the basins that I was studying in uh, California, just like the basin that I saw in uh, South America. So it's serendipity. You happen to be at the right place at the right time and you, you're you aware. That's the way we really do science. So I, I actually, encourage everybody in the room who teaches that 101 class or any science class to look at that understanding science website and use that to describe what science really is it's multi contextual and our high context students will no longer look at that linear logical thing that's in their textbook and say oh that's not really how I think about things because they don't some people do but most don't does that Thanks. answer your question it does yeah the, the way I the way I see what you described is it's the secondary model. It's much more circular. And while there are circles in the first, the second model does a better job of emphasizing that circular nature of going back and forth between different and, steps and, and the nonlinear nature. Because yeah. if I if I go back to that slide, let me see if I can here, uh, and I'll I'll um, move the chat and then let me share my screen again. If we go back to that slide, notice that this is solidly linear. Whereas over here, your question development is very nonlinear and very, very, it may start, it kind of touch in down here, but it's gonna go into talking to people. It's gonna look at benefits. It's gonna bounce all over the place. And the way they describe it on this, uh, on the Berkeley website is that it's like a pinball machine where it's bouncing back and forth all over the place. Whereas this linear approach really is strongly linear and follows a set step by step and i would say that it's very rare that we do the questions we build a hypothesis we predict we test it we get the results we go back to prediction i don't think we work that way because once we get our results we talk to our buddies and say hey this is what i found and then that gives us new ideas of new things to test it's very non-linear uh, but we teach that linear approach and for the low context students, they all say, oh, yeah, I get it. The high context students say, uh, what are you talking about? Thanks. Great. Thank yeah. you. Uh, else? Who else? Anybody else have questions? Any other grad students or undergrads? Then I guess we can open it up to anybody with questions. So go ahead. Hi, Gary. This hey, is Kara. Kara. It's so good to see you again. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you for pointing out the project. And I want to, I mean, everyone here knows in the department how so many people contribute uh, here in the department and outside um, to this to this Wild Rise project. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about during your talk um, and are thinking about our ability to do this kind of um work and the pressures that be in academia and i'm wondering if you have all looked at what's outside the institution level because i'm thinking about you know the pressures that be at our funding agencies <laughs> um because really i think about you know yes academic institutions need to change at the institutional level but so much of us are beholden to 
uh, our funding <laughs> and our ability to get funding. Yeah. And so major structural changes need to happen at those funding agencies and beyond, of course. Um, but I just think about like the funding agencies for now. And so I guess my question is, you know, have you been looking into ways to start putting pressures on those funding agencies? What is working? What is not working? How how are funding agencies maybe proactively responding to some of this? Yeah, we we haven't worked specifically on that at the group that I'm working with. And the multi-context theory, though, I believe is a pathway to articulate it. And if you look at NSF, they want to do this. The whole convergent research discussion and uh, NSF and wanting to fund convergent research, which is what you guys are doing, is there, but they don't know how to do it uh, because the value system is still, when you send in a project like that to get evaluated, a lot of it is evaluated on low context metrics. And so I think the, the funding agencies are having a hard time evaluating things on this and, and trying to figure out how do we do it and what metrics do we use to measure it. And they're pressured by Congress because Congress wants to see results. While it's really easy to show those low context metrics and say, we have X number of publications that come out of average uh, projects, which means that they're, they're accepted in the community and the community has X number of citations. And, and so you can show those metrics and they're very clear. Whereas the other metrics are less clear uh, and harder to demonstrate having impact. Um, I think it's going to take research to understand how to measure impact when it's not those those metrics. Now, I want to be really clear, though, and it's really important. We can't throw away the low context approaches to doing things. It's critical that we as disciplinary scientists understand our disciplines. I know how to model groundwater hydrology and do the heterogeneity and understand that sedimentology in a detailed way that most people won't. And I bring that to the table when I'm working in the convergent research model. As noted in your paper that you uh, gave to me, it, it's you're going to be given research questions that aren't exactly aligned with what you have trained to do, but you still have expertise to be able to address some of that especially in collaboration with others who have expertise that's not necessarily exactly aligned to the, the question you're trying to look at. But, but as a community, you, you do have that expertise. So it really takes time. It takes a lot of effort. And we're not trained that way of thinking. But at the same time, that low context way, that, that detail oriented way, understanding the details of how we do uh, specific tasks in science is critically important because we can't just fake it by looking at connections. We have to have that that meat on the bones too to understand the 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 details of those connections, the the the, the um, technological significance of these things. So the full spectrum is important, and I'm sure you guys are running into that with the Rice Project. Is that you need that full spectrum? The problem under our current system is NSF is on a five year funding at best, three years usually. These things take longer than that to develop. Uh, the, our academic tenure system, we want to see publications and funding record. And those happen within that specific time frame. and community based research takes longer to do. Uh, but, but I will say it leads to socially relevant research that on one side, people are looking at universities saying you're you're not relevant. You aren't doing things that we need. All you do is you teach our students and, and your research isn't relevant to the world. Some of it is, but most of it isn't. Uh, so our legislatures who fund us in public universities look at us and say, well, you aren't doing anything for the state. Why are you here other than educating our students? When we get into the, and spend the time on the convergent research model and the community-based research, we don't hit the metrics of the university and academic system, but we hit social relevance. Both are important. And I think the multi-context approach allows us to articulate what's going on in that. It doesn't fix it, but allows us language to use to be able to articulate 
what's going on in community-based, why is it important, how do we do it, how do we approach it as uh, academics, and what are the things that if in a low context check mark world of checking on, on metrics to see if you've done it, well, it articulates what some of those metrics might be. Um, and, and going back to the funding agencies, same with them. If they really want convergent research to develop, they need to fund long-term 10-year, 20-year projects that allow time to build those relationships, to work with communities, uh, to, to be able to, we're working on a paper now that talks about how multi-context theory, along with uh, 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 question formulation techniques, comes up with a, a way to do convergent research. And uh, I actually sent your paper off to, to my colleagues saying, hey guys, here's an example of what our paper is trying to talk about. Uh, and it's working. It still has bumps. It's not smooth, but it, but it's. Uh, I think our our funding agencies, our institutions, our entire our legislatures, they need to be aware that this is an important approach to to doing science. As is the low context approach. As is everything in between. It's all important. We just need to broaden and activate the full spectrum. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, kind of long-winded. You guys can get me on long-winded answers. I, I do that. Who else? Anyone else have a question? Well, let's thank Gary again for a wonderful presentation and for joining us and giving us the value of his expertise. Um, and so uh, that will do it for today. I, I will say really quickly, I'm available through email to ask questions and uh, feel free to contact me. I, I love talking about this stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, John. I'll, I'll see you into the future. Sounds good. I can stick around if anybody else has anything they want to say individually, but it looks like everybody's pretty much disappearing, which I would if it was five o'clock here. Yeah, it's kind of the end of the day, you know? Yeah. One of the things that I did in my department was we, we, uh, for a while until the university took it away from us, we really shifted our seminar.